Hi, I'm Aaron from Living Science Videos. When Charles Darwin started figuring out how life forms were related, he already knew from mixing different breeds of dogs and pigeons and other domestic animals that some traits come from the father and some from the mother. So he knew there had to be heritable units of information of some type that he couldn't understand that came from both parents and were blended together in the offspring. And he didn't know how that happened either. Cell theory showed that the cell is the basis of all life, and embryology showed that the earliest cells develop independently even after dividing. So whatever this information was, it must be hidden inside each and every single cell. But Darwin couldn't figure out what form this information took, and he couldn't identify it even though he knew right where to look. Later on, of course, Gregor Mendel discovered genetics, but regardless how much he learned and understood about that, he could only demonstrate it by its effects. Gene theory was like atomic theory, in that for the longest time, even though we could prove experimentally that atoms exist and genes exist, no one had ever seen an atom and no one had ever seen a gene. Well, there was one scientist who you hear about in a moment who actually had found that storehouse of information that everyone was looking for, but he didn't recognize it for what it was because he didn't know how to test it to see what it did. Why didn't he know what he was looking at? Well, imagine that you lived back in the 19th century like these people did. If you were to travel through time to my house in the 21st century, I could tell you that I have a library full of dozens of books, but you could look all over my house and not find this particular library, even if I were to open a drawer full of flash drives and show it to you. Because there's no way someone from the 19th century could understand what these are or the volumes of information they contain. Any one of these could contain your entire genome or even that of several other people too, depending on how it's uploaded. But of course, biological organisms don't use binary code. Instead, they use deoxyribonucleic acid, which isn't technically a code either. It's not a means of communicating anything, nor of concealing secrets. Nor is it a programming language, though it does look like one because of the way scientists have to abbreviate it. Why say deoxyribonucleic acid all the time when you can just call it DNA? It's easier and a faster way to say it and spell it. Likewise, DNA is made of four constituent chemical components, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And these can join together in extremely long and unique sequences, and the order of each section can be very important because that arrangement determines which proteins are created. So when scientists write out these really long sequences, they don't write the whole name again and again and again and again and again, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and over and over again. They just write the first letter of each one and move on to the next item in the chain. So what you get looks like a long string of computer programming code. It's not really letters or language. It's really just a chemical construct in a series of enzymatic reactions. But even if it's not technically a code or a blueprint, it is effectively one because it still serves the same function. It's not even a literal set of instructions, though it does effectively work as one because it perpetuates the cycle of life, where you are and every other living thing is essentially a copy of whatever your ancestors were. It's the chemical formula that makes you you and not someone or something else, like an asparagus or a gelatinous mass. DNA controls that chemically. So even if it's not technically a set of instructions or a blueprint, calling it a code of instructional information is effectively functionally correct, and it's easier to understand it that way. So how did scientists figure out what this information was or how it works? Here with that story is micro raw. Why is a stool like DNA? They both have four bases. <laughs> I'm sorry, that poem was really basic. But on a completely unrelated note, have you ever wondered about how we discovered DNA? I'm pretty sure you haven't, but too bad. I'll tell you anyways, because I find some sort of sick enjoyment in other people's pain. The history of DNA initiates in 1860, where Friedrich Meischer found a fun little stringy thingy inside of a white blood cell nucleus, which originated from the bandages from a local hospital. How pleasant. He called the stuff Nuclein, and proceeded to figure out absolutely nothing about it. However, a story is kind of weak compared to the story of Rosalind Franklin. In 1951, she was appointed by John Randall to take over the X-ray diffraction of DNA, because she seemed to be the only person at her college who knew how to do anything with it. However, Randall didn't really tell Morris Wilkins that, which led to the ever-intensifying tension between him and Franklin. It also didn't help that Franklin was impatient. She lived in a time where women scientists were extremely unpopular, and she was said to have an air of cool superiority. Wilkins and Franklin would continue to display a mutual disdain for each other for years. In 1953, she concluded that DNA was a double-stranded helical structure, so why do we never hear her name? Like, ever. Well, that's where James Watson and Francis Crick come in to get the lion's share of the credit. 
You see, using Rosalind's data, they already wrote a paper about it, which conveniently minimized Rosalind's role in the huge discovery. But how did they get the data? Well, the answer is quite obvious. Wilkins did it. Wilkins showed Watson Franklin's work, for which he, Crick, who made the model that they're famous for, and that scumbag Wilkins got the Nobel Prize for. Rosalind was not eligible because Nobel Prizes cannot be awarded posthumously, and unfortunately, Rosalind had died of ovarian cancer four years earlier. However, she had also done a lot of work on viral chemistry as well, specifically on the tomato mosaic and polio viruses. She also died before gaining a Nobel Prize for this, but her colleague Aaron Klug continued her work and got a Nobel Prize. Aaron, however, wasn't a terrible person and wrote against Watson's lack of credit for Franklin. Thanks, Micro Raw. Your DNA is found in chromosomes. Humans have 46 of them, 23 from each parent. DNA is often referred to as a twisted ladder, or more scientifically, a double helix. The steps, or rungs, of this ladder are made of the four types of nitrogenous bases, cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine, bound together by hydrogen bonds. DNA is a long chain of nucleotides, being deoxyribose, where DNA gets its name, plus a phosphate, and one of four nitrogenous bases. These nitrogen bases will only pair in a specific way. Cytosine will only pair with guanine, and thymine will only pair with adenine, and this helps with the replication process. Replication begins when an enzyme called helicase unzips the DNA into two single strands. Then another enzyme called primase adds an RNA primer to begin the replication process, using the existing strand as a template and adding nucleotides to the other side to make a new double strand. Another enzyme called DNA polymerase follows the helicase along a newly exposed single strand and inserts the appropriate nucleotides as it goes, matching cytosine with guanine and thymine with adenine from the surrounding matrix, thus creating an identical copy of double-strand DNA. And that seems sensible, and you'd think the same thing would be going on on the other side, but it's not. It can't, because the two sides are anti-parallel. It's like one half of this ladder was built upside down, and DNA polymerase can only work one way, starting from the fifth carbon atom of each nucleotide and working to the third carbon atom. I'd have thought there was another DNA polymerase designed to work in the opposite fashion so that they could both go in the same direction, following right along with the helicase. I think that would be an intelligent design, but you got to work with what you got, and DNA polymerase only works one way, only from the five prime to the three prime. So instead, what you get is this convoluted apparatus where the leading strand is copied straight out and the other strand, the lagging strand, is treated more like the thread in your grandmother's sewing machine. As with the leading strand, replication on the lagging strand begins with an RNA primer. Then polymerase builds DNA into that blank section called the Okasaki fragment. Then the process begins a bit further down the strand and is repeated again and again and again. While that's happening, DNA polymerase 1 replaces the RNA primers with DNA nucleotides, and DNA ligose follows that to weld the strands together with hydrogen bonds. Finally, this way too complicated process has produced two identical double helical copies of DNA.